You can join in when I start. <laughs> Please join in. It's number, it, it's number 389. We don't have a screen today, so. So I'll sing it and you can sing it back to me. Here we go. 389 in your hardback hymnal. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour. Gathered here in one strong body. Gathered here in the struggle and the power. Spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour. Gathered here in one strong body. Gathered here in the struggle and the power. Spirit draw near. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour. Gathered here in one strong body. Gathered here in the struggle and the power. Spirit drawn Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for gathering here as the one strong, very strong body of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane. This is the place where we join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and from which we champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in the wider world. Or as we like to say in short, create community, find meaning, and work for justice. That's hard, important work, as you all know, and it takes all of us. And so we welcome everyone here who wants to join us in that work. We're glad to have you here. We appreciate and uh, flourish from your different perspectives, backgrounds, histories, lifestyles. And so whether you're here with us uh, in person this morning or joining us online through our streaming service, uh, we're, we're very glad that you're here. Thanks for coming. My name is David Boos. I'm honored to be your lay leader this morning, uh, and I'm also delighted to share the front of the church with uh, three wonderful guests. Uh, providing music for us this morning are Kelsey and Marissa Weddle, who you'll hear from later. We have heard from them before. Uh, and yeah, they will be taking your breath away later on in the service. Uh, I'm also joined here on the podium by my colleague, uh, Dr. Emily Clark, from the Religious Studies Department at Gonzaga University, where she's an assistant professor. So, <laughs> uh, I will in introduce her more fully later on, but I do want to thank her for coming and sharing uh, some of her scholarship and insights uh, with us this morning. Uh, before we greet one another, I do have uh, three quick announcements. Um, first of all, uh, as you know, our community auction is coming up. That's one of the church's largest uh, fundraisers, and uh, it is something that we all contribute to. And so there's a table back in the back in the Friendship Hall with ideas for things that you can uh, donate for auction. Um, and of course, when it comes time to bid on those things, we'll have our big opening ceremony, and you can take part in that. So please do stop by. We're looking for lots of things to make available for the, the community auction. Uh, second, there uh, will be a meeting here at the church later on today uh, on Initiative 940, which is intended to modernize Washington's police accountability laws. This is an initiative that will go to the state legislature. It's gathering signatures at this point. Um, and it would require law enforcement to receive violence, de-escalation, mental health, and first aid training, would change standards for the use of deadly force, adding a good faith standard and independent investigation. Uh, the meeting this afternoon is an opportunity to learn more about the initiative and how you can uh, be part of supporting it. Um, that's at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, and then finally, I want to bring to your attention a pair of workshops. Uh, there's a, uh, apparently a flyer on this in the focus uh, on nonviolent communication entitled Bridging the Divide. Uh, the workshops are being led by Kathleen McFerrin, who's a certified trainer with the Center for Nonviolent Communication. Uh, the workshops will be held on Wednesday, October 4th, and Saturday, October 7th. 
And the goal is to uh, help us learn how to get past sticking points in conversations around hot button issues, how to stay with conversations that are hard, um, and to uh, connect in a meaningful way with people who have views that might be very different from ours, and understand how listening is a key component of social justice work. So if you're interested in that, uh, more information, there's more flyers back on a table in the back in the Friendship Hall, um, and you can avail yourselves of that after the service. For now, I invite you to uh, greet one another as we do every Sunday morning. Uh, if you have been here for a long time, join uh, and, and greet the friends that you know and like to see. Um, if you're somebody who's here for the first time or one of the first times, uh, extend a hand and I guarantee that you'll be warmly greeted. As always, there will be plenty of time to continue those conversations uh, in the Friendship Hall after our service. Um, for now, we'll turn from our informal greeting of one another to formally begin our service with the lighting of our chalice. The chalice is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May, it, if, may the small flame be an offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth is lost and cast a shadow of reasonable doubt where it's been found. <coughs> Take a breath. The word spirit comes from the Latin spiritus, related to spirere, to breathe. And of course it does, because what is better than breath to describe something so immaterial, so ephemeral, and yet so vital as spirit? When the spirit has left the body, it has lost its life force, taken its last breath. It has expired. To inspire, as an intransitive verb, means to breathe in, to inhale. As a transitive verb, it means to influence, animate, or actuate a person with a feeling, an idea, an impulse. It means, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, to infuse something into the mind, to kindle, arouse, awaken in the mind or heart. It means to prompt someone to a thought or an action. In archaic usages, it meant to blow the spirit into someone, to actually fill them with the spirit. To conspire is to act or work together toward the same goal. At its root, it means to breathe together. So I invite you this morning to open yourself to the spirit in this place, to breathe, to enjoy the fellowship of your co-conspirators here breathing with you, to let something awaken in your mind 
or your heart, to be prompted to work together toward our shared goals. In short, to be inspired. And as you keep breathing in and out, um, we want to celebrate a special occasion. It actually happened last Friday on the 22nd, and that's the autumnal equinox, which marks the equal day, equal night place that we come to in our trip around the sun and in, in the convolutions that we go through on our planet. Um, you will notice that the banner has changed. It is now the autumn banner over here to your right. And we also do a ritual song this day. Um, we're going to do number 73, Chant for the Seasons. We're going to do the autumn verse, which is the first verse in your book. It is in your gray hymnal, your hardback hymnal. So number 73, Chant for the Seasons. Please rise as you're willing and able. time for the story for all ages and they see many children could you come closer so that you can see this map please I love when children learn something from the map but I want to tell you that every September every year on the 21st of September people around the world um, observe the world peace and 20 and um, 72 years ago, you may know or you may not know, 72 years ago marked the end of the Second World War. Do you know why the World War is called World War? It's no, yeah, I, I didn't know either. It's because the war involved many countries of the world, many continents, and I was born, by the way, in Russia, this big country, in the middle of that war. And for Russia, it was the great patriotic war because the Russian people defended their country against the invasion of their German fascists. In those days, the United States, this is where we live, and Russia were friends. They were on one side together against the common enemy. Many millions of people were killed during that war. My story is about a song dedicated to the fallen soldiers. But I would like to begin my story with a, a girl who lived in Japan. This is Japan. So the girl's name was Sadako. Sadako was two years old when atomic bomb was dropped on her hometown Hiroshima. Many innocent lives were lost as a result of the explosion. Sadako didn't die. She grew up strong up till 11 years of age when she all of a sudden got sick and was hospitalized. Her disease was caused by radiation from that atomic bomb. And Sadako was very sad and she wanted to be healthy and she re knew that belief of the Japanese people 
that if you fold 1,000 paper cranes, your wish will be granted. What was her wish? To be healthy and for the country to live in peace, right? Do you know how to fold paper cranes? No, I didn't know either. Yesterday I looked at the YouTube and started folding and it was horrible. I couldn't make it. It is so complicated. Imagine this little girl in the hospital folding paper cranes from all pieces of paper that she could find and she managed to fold 600. But she did not survive. She didn't recover. Sorry, it's a sad story. The girl died at the age of 12. In memory of that girl, Japanese people opened a memorial in Hiroshima with a statue of Sadako holding a paper crane above her head. Now we'll travel to a different country. And this is a small country between the two seas, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea in the Caucasus Mountains called Dagestan. You've never heard it, but it's okay. Dagestani poet Rasul Gamzata lived there. 24 years after the end of the war, Gamzatov traveled to Japan, and as a tourist, he was taken to the memorial park in Hiroshima. He was impressed by the statue of Sadako, but most of all, he was impressed by the story about the little girl who was folding the paper cranes, because he built, uh, all of a sudden, he just, it occurred to me, he heard a legend when he was a child. In the village where he was born, the people, Dagestani people, believed that soldiers who were killed in the war, that their souls, actually, the souls of the soldiers, turn into white cranes and they fly away. So, inspired by that belief and by the story, the poet wrote a poem. I sometimes think that riders brave who met their death in bloody fight were never buried in a grave, but rose as cranes with plumage white. Now, guess we go back to Russia where I was born, and there, because the poem was written in Avar language, from Dagestan, it was translated by somebody into Russian. So, in Moscow, there lived a famous singer whose name was Mark Bernes, very famous. He was almost like Frank Sinatra here. And uh, he looked, read the poem, and the words of the poem touched him so deeply on a personal level. I must tell you that Bernes was seriously ill and the doctors told him he had only six months to live. So he knew a wonderful, wonderful popular composer whose name was Young Frankel. He went to compose and said, please, please, I wish this poem was a song and I could sing it. And the composer was persuaded to create the song. He put the words of the poem into music and the singer managed to record the song just one month before he died. The song was so popular, overwhelming popularity because uh, it became a symbol of common sorrow, a requiem for those who didn't come back home from the war. And the composer, Russian composer, and the Dagestani poet met at the presentation of the song for the first time. They lived very far away. There were different nationalities, but they became friends for life. They were united by that song.
We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which sustains this community and our mission to the larger world. say they'd take your breath away? Okay, breathe. <sighs> Thank you, again. Uh, if you'd like to hear more, uh, there well, there's more coming up th this morning, but they're also performing later on this afternoon at Valley Fest, so if you want to spend a lovely afternoon out in the valley, um, they'll be singing out there later on, so yeah. Thank you so much. Each time we gather as a congregation, there are always those who are with us in our minds and hearts and who we want to wrap in our love and care. 
You will have noticed this morning that we have our unity candle lit, uh, which we light every time we uh, lose a member of our congregation. So I want to begin this morning with a candle for Dr. John Stevenson, a longtime member of our congregation. We found out after our services last Sunday that he had died that Saturday, and in fact his memorial service was just this past Friday uh, here at the church. So um, there was a nice uh, tribute to him in the email uh, weekly summary that went out this week, so if you get that, um, there's more information there. But this morning we hold uh, his wife Cynthia and the rest of their family in our hearts. We also light a candle for Dr. Vic Castleberry, who passed away a couple of weeks ago. And finally, I want to light a candle for all of those who are suffering loss and displacement, fear and uncertainty after the natural disasters of Hurricanes Irma and Maria and the earthquake this week in Mexico City. Our hearts go out to them as they face a very long and difficult road back to safety and security. Let us now share a moment in silence, embracing others who are here on our hearts this morning. You're welcome to say their names aloud as you are willing. Those named aloud and those remembered in the silence and all those who are suffering elsewhere in our world this hour, we hold in our community of compassion. This is the time in our service where we take a few moments for silent meditation, so I invite you to make yourself comfortable as you wish. The words to take us into meditation this morning come from the mystic poet Rumi poem entitled Only Breath. Not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I am not from the East or the West, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist, am not an entity in this world or in the next did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one and that one call to and know, first, last, outer, inner, only that breath breathing human being. This morning, our speaker, Emily, is uh, going to be sharing from her scholarship around uh, a group of Afro-Creole spiritualists from New Orleans. And as 
reading this morning, she uh, has selected two uh, messages that were received by this group at different points in time. Uh, the spirit of assassinated President Abraham Lincoln signed both of these messages. First comes from February 8, 1872. My brother, John Brown, has spoken. People, stop advancing in the terrible path you follow. Listen to the voice of this noble martyr. Thou hast, like me, murdered him. Like me, thou hast killed him, but the idea has progressed. Beware, thy hate blinds you. Let thee be enlightened by the idea. A man may disappear, but the idea never stops advancing. Imitate him. Otherwise, thou will drag thyself in the mire instead of marching in the blood thou dreamt of. And from September 4th, 1874. <clears throat> The shedding of the blood belonging to the unfortunate ones who have lost their lives under the blows of the monstrous, monstrous oligarchy who wanted and still wants to crush out the germ of civil rights for the dark-skinned children. This blood belonging to unfortunate ones is a shame for the infuriated ones inhabiting your section and who, one day, will come here to mediate on their horrible crimes and their depravity of manners. O oh, you who have participated in the shedding of this blood, either by your oral and quiescent approval or by the sophisms you have preached, retribution will give you heart-rending lessons. The genealogy of your ancestors will be there to surprise nearly every one of you, and your silly vanities will be lost in this exposition of what will render you very humble, believe me. Oh, this bloodshed will have served to create the elect army who are recruited here by the progress of beings out of the body, and they will be your guides who will show you the way toward which they will lead you as the one which will cleanse you from your defilement and infamies. There will be triumph for the martyrs, and there will be shame for the oppressors. You, excuse me, you cannot delay the triumph of justice. There will be, for the downtrodden, their rights proclaimed and upheld in spite of all. You may gnash your teeth, oppressors, but you will be compliant and yielding. Because he's crafty and full of lies I hear that, that wonderful spirit to keep me wise Every time I feel the spirit Moving in my heart I will pray, will pray Yes, every time I feel the spirit Moving in my heart I will pray Moving in my heart Pray, moving in my heart. 
so much. <clears throat> I'm inspired. <laughs> uh, as I said, I'm very pleased this morning to uh, welcome my colleague, Dr. Emily Clark, to our church this morning. Uh, I've known Emily since she arrived at Gonzaga uh, in 2014, and she has very quickly made her mark as a teacher and a scholar in the Religious Studies Department. Uh, she's long been interested in the intersections between religion and race and politics in American history, and uh, that led her to the topic of her first book and this morning's sermon. That book, called A Luminous Brotherhood, Afro-Creole Spiritualism in, the 19th, in 19th Century New Orleans, explores how the beliefs and practices of spiritualism helped Afro-Creoles mediate the political and social changes in Reconstruction New Orleans. I should point out the book has already received quite a bit of attention uh, despite having just come out this summer. Um, Emily gave the Conrad Wright Lecture at the UUA General Assembly in New Orleans this summer. Um, that, uh, talk, uh, is, that lecture is sponsored by the UU History and Heritage Society. And uh, the book's received two awards already, the Francis B. Simpkins Award from the Southern Historical Association and the Michael Thomason Award from the Gulf South Historical Association. So already making some waves. People of all cultures look to their faith as a foundation in times of challenge. In the post-Civil War South, the new opportunities that were offered for African Americans were at the same time constrained by the resurgent white supremacy of the Reconstruction. For the spiritualist brotherhood that Emily writes about in her book, their religious experiences also served as a forum for political activism, something that is not too foreign to this group here. Uh, in a nation that continues to be divided on questions of religion and race, those spirits still have a lot to teach us. So please welcome Dr. Emily Clark. On September 4th, 1874, the spirit of Abraham Lincoln delivered one of his many messages to a group of Afro-Creole spiritualists. The message's timing was noteworthy. The Afro-Creole spiritualist home city of New Orleans was on the brink of racial violence. The tension was as palpable as the Louisiana humidity, and whispers of conspiratorial violence were heard on every street corner. A week and a half after Lincoln's message, the white supremacist White League took the city by force and ruled for three and a half days. The terror that came with the White League's temporary reign heightened the significance of the slain president's September 4th message. Lincoln's spirit focused on the blood of the innocent. He first lamented the shedding of the blood of those who fought for black civil rights against the monstrous oligarchy. Then Lincoln's spirit went on to warn those white supremacists of the monstrous oligarchy that they would deeply regret their participation in racial violence, either their active involvement or their passive acceptance. After death, those guilty would regret their horrible crimes and their depravity of manners. In contrast, those who fought for black civil rights and the progress of humanity would be illuminated in the spirit world. These social justice martyrs would serve as guides to the spirits of former white supremacists and help teach them the value of all human life. There will be triumph for the martyrs, Lincoln proclaimed, and there will be shame for the oppressors. He concluded his message with a reiteration of his warning, you cannot delay the triumph of justice. Instead, the rights of all the downtrodden, the rights of all the downtrodden will be proclaimed and upheld in spite of all, and the oppressors will gnash their teeth in remorse. The Afro-Creole men seated at the seance table called themselves the Sir Carmenique, practiced spiritualism once or twice a week, and kept records of all their spiritual interactions. In a nutshell, 19th century American spiritualism centered on regular contact with the spirit world, and this often took the form of seances. The seance records of the Sir Carmenique range from 1858, so just before the Civil War, to 1877, the end of Reconstruction. And during this 20-year period, a political pantheon of spirits visited the Sir Carmenique to deliver messages of hope and advice. Joining Abraham Lincoln was John Brown, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Robespierre, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Robert E. Lee, Jesus, Confucius, St. Vincent de Paul, and local Catholic clerics. 
This list only scratches the surface. Along with these political and religious celebrities, the medium's deceased family members and neighbors also delivered messages. Together, the spirits comprised a vibrant celestial society of interacting equals. The spirit messages broke a variety of topics, but on the whole, the primary focus of the spirits was the progress of humanity. They frequently referenced what they called the idea, by which they meant egalitarian republicanism and real equality. Similar to beliefs about millennial progress sweeping across 19th century America, the idea required the Afro-Creole spiritualists to work during their material lives and make the world a better place. According to the spirits, God intended the idea to structure the world and ensure universal liberty. However, the Sir Carmenique observed a discrepancy between the ideal egalitarian spirit world and the corrupt, raced material world. From 1858 to 1877, the Afro-Creole spiritualists saw their city go from a humming slave port to a fervent Confederate stronghold to a site of Union occupation to a bustling center of Louisiana Republican politics to home of some of the worst Reconstruction race violence to the seat of the first black lieutenant governor in the United States and finally back near the beginning as a city run by white supremacist politics. This is a lot of twists and turns for two decades. And through it all, the Sir Carmenique received advisement from the spirit world. That spirit world was one organized as a meritocracy with one goal, to help make the material world a better place. Over the course of their 19 years of practice, they filled over 30 large register books, amounting to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of spirit messages. Their wisdom brought comfort in the face of violence and oppression, guidance during uncertain times, and confidence that progress was possible and on the horizon. Considering the recent attention and focus on the removal of Confederate monuments from New Orleans and other places around the South, it seems particularly relevant to consider the Spirit's response to the 1874 Battle of Liberty Place. Conversations about racial violence had long been common at the seance table. Messages and spirits decried the violence inherent in American slavery, lamented how slave owners chained African Americans like beasts of burden, treated them as dogs, and denied them their most sacred rights. The spirit's strong critique of violence against black bodies was amplified after the New Orleans so-called Battle of Liberty Place and the resulting white supremacist rule of the city. Dissatisfied with the Republican government rule during Reconstruction, a group of Confederate veterans, former slave owners, and white supremacists formed the White League, a paramilitary group with Ku Klux Klan-like views. The White League justified their founding with the fear of supposed Black Leagues, which didn't actually exist, um, that they feared would form and terrorize the city. To combat this, the White League commenced their own brand of terrorism. In September of 1874, members of the White League published criticism and, criticisms and laments of their local Republican government and police raids on their weapon stores. This was part of a coordinated campaign that culminated in the White League meeting at the Henry Clay statue downtown on September 14th, less than two weeks after that message from Lincoln that I opened with and that David read in its entirety. Speakers riled up the crowd, and at one point the White League was chanting about hanging the current governor, William Kellogg. White League members then illegally boarded a steamer docked in the port and seized all the weapons on board. When the local police force caught wind of the White League's plan, it was already too late. White League members had set up barricades over town to block the police force movement, and now the White League was also heavily armed. Within an hour, the White League overpowered and outnumbered the interracial Metropolitan Police Force. Over 30 people died that day, including innocent bystanders. The following morning, the police and local militia surrendered their remaining weapons to the White League. After defeating the local police, the White League seized local government buildings. Between then and the arrival of federal troops who reinstated lawful rule to New Orleans, the white supremacists controlled the city for four days. As I was rereading this and thinking about this, I couldn't get the images of Charlottesville over the summer out of my mind. The day following the white Southerners, the day following what white Southerners would call the Battle of Liberty Place, the spirit of St. Vincent de Paul lamented 
The bloodshed yesterday that demonstrates how much hatred there is in the hearts of those men to seek to enthrall their, who seek to enthrall their brothers. But he assured them, you will see the civil rights of each one proclaimed and they will be maintained. He and other spirits would take care of the righteous dead. Those still in the material fight on earth should remain positive because this was only the passing of some clouds, but which will let the clear sky of the future. He recognized that his words were written at a time of the apparent triumph of the oligarchy, but he classified them differently. His message was meant to reiterate the certainty that you will realize the full conquest of your proclaimed and maintained rights. He encouraged them to preserve their courage. You have been the victims, the unfortunate ones, slaughtered by barbarian brothers who were blindfolded by their hatred, envy, and the prostitutions in their thoughts. The Sir Carmonique should fear nothing. The sun of realization is beautiful and magnificent. Oh, my children, forward. And wait with expectancy for what your guides promise to you. The spirit of a second lieutenant in the Confederate Louisiana Infantry named C.W. Colbertson also appeared on the 15th of September to report that he was crying and moaning after entering the spirit world. His spirit suffered because he had ignored these great and noble thoughts of freedom and equality for all beings. And instead, he had wanted to protect the ideas of the proud oligarchy of race, meaning white supremacy. The day following the so-called Battle of Liberty Place was an auspicious time for a Confederate spirit to grieve for his past ideology and actions. Now surrounded by the wisdom of the spirit world, he recognized the universal truth of rights and equality, just as all white supremacists would after their own deaths. Following Colbertson, a spirit identified as Andre reminded the Sir Carmonique that spirits might arrive in the spiritual world imbued with their prejudice, but he promised that these spirits would encounter truth and then work for good. In the days that followed, the Battle of Liberty Place, temporary white league rule, and the restoration of a lawful government, the spirits tried to reassure these black spiritualists. A devoted brother encouraged them to remain focused on universal solidarity as their guiding principle. As order was restored in New Orleans following the violence, the spirit of St. Vincent de Paul appeared again and reflected on martyrs, violence, and the recent unrest. He assured them that a large amount of spirits rallied around them, including the martyrs who had fallen. Despite, this apparent power, despite the apparent power this white supremacist oligarchy yielded, members of the Sir Carmonique were not to worry because the sun of liberty shined brightly on them with the promise of redemption. Though a blood pack had been signed to destroy you, a hungry pack of carnage came for them on the 14th of September. Black civil rights were proclaimed and maintained. The Sir Carmonique also had the hearts of martyrs on their side. Though these days were soaked in, though these days were soaked in violence, St. Vincent de Paul and all spirits assured them that the table will not be stained with blood. Rather, the spirit guides are with you. We know your pain, your expectations, and we talk and proclaim your arrival with dignity, recognizing. This repeated reference to rights proclaimed and maintained offered hope in the wake of such instability and violence. Racial and economic injustices in the United States meant that the Afro-Creole spiritualists were to be tireless workers and thinkers. And thinkers should not be afraid to criticize oppressive regimes, laws, and social systems. The spirits admired those who fought against the infamous powers who want to dominate man as master of his conscience or his political liberty. Combating prejudice, bigotry, air, and superstition cultivated a noble soul. Despotic leaders were frowned upon, as was greed, especially when that greed was linked to a desire for domination. Only the grand voice of the people could succeed in stopping the advance of a tyrant's domination. Those hungry for power and the malicious were not happy in the spirit world. The spirits of those who worked against progress, liberty, and republicanism felt shame. In death, even the spirit of John Wilkes Booth had to admit that nothing could stop the march of progress, and woe to those who want to obstruct the road. The spirits argued that slavery and white supremacy impeded humanity's progress. The end of human slavery and the anticipated end of moral slavery were linked to the idea, that guiding principle of equality.
According to another spirit, slavery's abolition threw a great disturbance in the eye and the ideas of backwards minds, meaning pro-slavery Americans, who could not understand their own prejudices. An unsigned message asked if the circle could hear the shrieks that came from the slave during his degrading punishment. The unknown spirit asked for pardon, admitting, I was blind, I was weak. The identity of the spirit is unclear, but considering his need for pardon, the spirit likely engaged in this behavior that he lamented, the lashing of enslaved black bodies. For many former slavery supporters, death revealed the immorality of riveting chains. Instead, they now spoke of liberty and social justice. Unlike American politics and society, which base their hierarchies in part on racial difference, the spirits denied the ontology of race. Both blacks and whites would be luminous in the spirit world because in spirit form and before God, there were only equal beings. One spirit noted that if Jesus had possessed a black envelope, meaning body, and was capped with woolly or crisped hair, he would have been disowned by many. His race should not matter, but the spirits knew in the material world, it would have. Those still on earth had no idea what race Jesus was. In one of his messages, George Washington's spirit talked about how we don't know if he's black, yellow, white, what have you. Race marked one's material body, but not one's spirit or soul. After death, when one left the material body, the spirit entered a raceless world. The spirit guides noted that race meant little in the spirit world and therefore should have little significance on earth. Confucius affirmed that there were no different races because all were children of the same father. The great lesson of death was recognizing equality and solidarity. The revolutionary French priest, Hugh Felicité Robert de Lamine, agreed and explained that spiritualism disregarded categories like race or nationality. Though the spirits deemed race irrelevant, they were aware of the racial realities of the material world and the consequences of inhabiting race bodies. The spirit of a black Union veteran lamented how the black son of the Republic had been pushed to work in the fields like a flock of sheep. Those in power had decided to refuse their black brothers full rights and instead force them into human bondage, but their only crime was being black. The races of material bodies no longer existed in the spirit world, and instead the color of spirits typically was described simply as bright. A former slave noted that while his body was black, his new spiritual self was bright and shiny. Lamine explained that spirits possessed luminous bodies. The soul gave off a radiant glow in the spirit world, and this glow illustrated one's true value. The transformation of a spirit after death happened according to the state of his soul, rather than according to his physical appearance or social status. And one can be held accountable for the state of their soul. The soul appeared in the spiritual world relative to its spiritual beauty or ugliness. A spirit would manifest more beautiful in the higher spheres due to a spirit's dedication to love, charity, and selflessness. It seemed that in the spirit world, the spirits finally experienced what Thomas Jefferson claimed in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. The spirits believed that America's destiny was wrapped up with that idea of equality, this political philosophy was America's true self and destiny, and if it succeeded, it could secure real social justice in the material world, too. Well, you've heard inspiring words and heard inspiring songs, and it's time to inspire each other with the last song. We're going to do something out of our turquoise hymnal. Please find one under the chair, uh, should be in front of you, and it's number 1024, when the Spirit says do, and inspire each other. Stand, please, as you're willing and able. You gotta do when the Spirit says do. You gotta do when the Spirit says do. When the Spirit says do, you gotta do, oh Lord. You gotta do when the Spirit says do. 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 
you to join hands for our benediction. <laughs> the benediction this morning comes from Sarah Moores Campbell. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of insight. Let us gather them up for the precious gifts that they are and, renewed by their grace, move boldly into the unknown. Amen. Blessed be. Salam alaikum. Shalom. <laughs>